I have a fear of that which I don't know, of things I don't understand. That fear is not strong enough to keep me away from those things, but it does often make me procrastinate until I can't put it off any longer. I don't understand boat building. I don't understand how it works or the names of things, and I'm quite sure I'll get the terms wrong here. But my curiosity outweighs that fear, and when I found out that some shipwrights were building a small wooden boat at the Los Angeles Maritime Institute, or LAMI as it's called, I had to get involved and learn the secrets of their trade. How do you build a wooden boat? And why have these men chosen this, of all things, to do with their lives? There was something deeper here than the romance of boat building. Like a newborn child, a boat is full of possibilities. With each frame and plank and polished bright work, the boat is endowed with the hope of sailing into adventure. It's as if this tree was meant to be this beautiful creation, returning once again to sway in the breeze. One of the shipwrights we're working with has built a Haven 12 and a half before. This is what the boat will most likely look like when we're finished. And this is where it begins. So what we could do is just put a straight edge on this. Your idea, exactly. Bandsaw it, join it straight, and then we can start ripping off. Because if you can see the grain of all of this, it is like straight as a string. Yeah. And then if we take this bark off, and we look at the edge grain here, we can work with all of this. We're building a boat called a Haven 12 and a half. 12 and a half feet is the waterline length. The boat is actually 16 feet long. It's a sailboat. There was a famous American naval architect, Nathaniel Green Hershoff, who started designing yachts, uh, motorboats before the turn of the, of the 20th century. Uh, so in, you know, 1890s, he got going. He founded the Hershoff Manufacturing Company. He designed this boat, I think, shortly after 1900. It was called the Hershoff 12 and a half. For a lot of reasons, those plans are not available. So a boatyard owner, yacht designer named Joel White in Brooklyn, Maine, had one of those boats and took the measurements off of it and redesigned it slightly, made it a little bit beamier. The keel is shallower and it has a centerboard, so it's easily trailered. But it has some of the, the wonderful sailing characteristics of this. They're incredibly sweet boats. They're fast, they handle really well. They're just comfortable. You get in it and you just think, wow, this is, this is relaxing. This is what sailing should be like. I'm Greg Rice. When I was born, my father already had a 40-foot long gaff-rigged yawl that had been built in 1929 in British Columbia. From a very, very, very young age, I remember laying in my bunk, going to sleep, and looking up and seeing deck beams and the framing of the hull, and big hanging knees which reinforced the deck and the whole juncture. And just thinking to myself, this is what a boat looks like. When I started sailing on my own small eight-foot sabot and racing it, uh, I started making rudders and dagger boards and, you know, booms and masts. I went to the Northwest School of Wooden Boat Building in Port Townsend, Washington. And that was in 1993. Graduated from there and came back to Southern California. I'm Greg Stewart. Um, I'm, uh... 72. I wanted to build a boat since I was a little boy. I remember asking my dad, who was a framer, you can imagine, framing all day, every day, five days a week, and then your little boy says, come on, dad, let's build a boat. It didn't happen. But, but I, you know, I forgave him because that was a rough life. When I first got out of college, I, was, I owned a small cabinet business with a few guys. I developed commercial real estate. I did that for about 35 years. It was there that I discovered how much I really like to make things. The first boat I built, the uh, designers said, call me anytime. There's, there's some real friendly boat designers out there for those of us who, you know, have always wanted to build a boat. One of our builders on the team, uh, Duncan, has built several boats in his life, and now he's doing it again. <laughs>
My name is Duncan McDuffie. I've always had an interest in carpentry and I had a great shop teacher uh, when I was in high school who taught me about tools and building things. He also taught me how to clean a paintbrush for which I will be indebted to him forever. This is a frame twisting tool. Oh, you found it. Yeah, so you put that on the frame as you're tying it down. You, you can twist it with this a little bit. Yes. You can. bend it down because then it, it needs to sit as flush. And you can see the curve in there. Yeah. All the, the flusher it sits, the better the, the planking will, right. will look. I like to build things. I like to have something to look at at the end of your efforts. I was in my 30s that I wanted to do more with carpentry, but I didn't have the patience for furniture building where if you make one mistake, it's ruined. So I thought, well, maybe I'll build small boats. I built this little Glenel Marine. It was just a little plywood skiff and put a sailing rig on it. It was kind of ugly and didn't sail very well, but it, it was fun and the kids would go out in it. Then I decided to do a lap strake uh, Ian Outtread design, 12 foot. It's called an acorn skiff. Fairly soon after finishing the acorn skiff, I decided I wanted to build a real traditionally built boat. I decided to build the Haven 12 and a half. The Hershoff company built all their boats upside down with a mold for each of the frames or ribs. Steam bend the frames onto the molds. You attach floors to the frames. You then put the keel and the transom and the stem on it. And once that's all done, you're ready to plank and you plank the boat up and then you turn it over and start finishing the inside and you know, and on it goes. It took two years of part-time work. The, the draw dogs were indeed used by the previous person. The previous fellow. So there's a, the hole and there is a... Oh yeah. They those drilled. were drilled. So you'd come in here and you'd do this. You'd say, okay, Looks like it wants to go in right about there. Yeah. If this is up a little bit, you could twist it over to, you see, to oh. cat. Oh, I, I think. get it. I get it. Yeah. Well, and that's that, really quite, quite uh, clever. You're going to run out of clamps eventually, so you got to have something you can leave on until yeah. you start planking. Draw dogs made from 30D common nails whose heads have been sawn off. It works. <laughs> that looks brutal. Oh, this is, this is yeah. I got involved in Lammy about five years ago. I got one of their newsletters that said they were going to be teaching boat building to kids. Sent an email off to Lammy and said, hey, I've got all the tools to do this class, and I've built several boats. I'd be happy to teach it. And five years later, I'm still with Lammy, uh, volunteering um, as a faux uh, shipwright. So when you put the dowel in early in 1994, read about Lammy, and they talked about the Topsail Youth Program, which at that time was just a couple of years old. I just went into the office and said to the receptionist, and I just wondered, do you need volunteers? I was really attracted to the mission of Lammy and the Topsail Youth Program. Because when I was young, sailing got me through a lot of really rough times. You know, when I was out on a boat, there's no way not to be in the now. There's no way not to be focused. And so that was really, really helpful to me uh, with some of the struggles I went through, as anyone goes through growing up. And so I thought, this is a really great program, and it deserves support. I was here one day, uh, maybe three years ago, and in walks this guy and introduces himself as a retired minister. He started to build a, um, a Harish Hof uh, 12 and a half, and he'd never built a boat before in his life. And it got complicated, because they are. And um, so he said, you know, I decided to go back into the ministry working with homeless people. I want to donate all the work that I've done and all the materials that I've purchased, but you have to promise me one thing, and that is you'll finish the boat. It, it helps to start with a simple boat. 
uh, and, and learn to read the plans that way and work your way up. I mean, th that would be my advice to somebody who wanted to build a boat, would be build a small one. You know, build a small, relatively simple boat first and learn the techniques, learn how to read the plans, figure it out. I mean, the interesting thing about boat plans is all the information's there, but it's all over the place. And it might not be repeated, so you have to find it. Where is it on the plans? And where's the little note that tells you that those keel bolts are 5 16ths inch? Because, as I say, it may only tell you on one of the little drawings of a little bolt that it's 5 16ths, but it applies to all of them, except where it tells you it's something else. It's all there, and you end up spending a lot of time looking at the plans. So I guess we can't find the uh, <laughs> brand new plans that we bought. We've got some of them, some but of them. we can't find this main one. It's no. I think it's in Greg R's locker. So this is the 27-year-old version that uh, we're going to left over. We're going to work from today. When you buy a set of plans, it's a license to build uh, one boat from those plans. If you want to build another one, you buy another set of plans. Uh, right now, we can't find the main plan, and so we are using my 27-year-old sheet until we do, but we have paid for the license for a new boat. <laughs> you know, you can see kind of how the boat goes together here, yeah. where you've got the lead shoe keel, the, the wood keel that lays this structure here that attaches to the transom and the stem. Then you've got, a, it shows the floor, and there's a floor, so the ribs are riveted to the floors, the floors are bolted to the keel. Uh, this is the centerboard trunk that the centerboard goes through. That's only in this section here. It shows seats and seat supports. And then all of this detail up here, which is the shear clamp, the molded shear strake, and then these boats have a beautiful combing. You can see it here that sticks up and provides some protection against water splashing into the into the cabin. In the in the old days, this is the basically how they would display the shape of the boat. You'd have a table of offsets, and by offset they mean the distance at any certain point to a fixed reference point. And so you would have to take all of that information from these drawings people trying to sell plans to, to folks like us who want to build a boat, they go and do all of that. The process is called lofting, and yeah. you don't have to do it because they've done that for you. So we could take these shapes and use those to make each of the molds. So this is number 18. So here's, here's the shape of number 18. And that's this shape here, and it's the same on the other side. This particular boat, when you buy the plans to it, it comes with full-size patterns printed out on paper for each one of the molds. And so the mold is literally just a structure that is shaped uh, the same as the hull at a particular point in the boat going across the boat. The way Hershoff did it, he had a mold made for every single one of the frames. So for the frames, the best wood that I'm aware of is uh, white oak. This grain travels over two feet before it runs out. So that that meets our 12 to 1 grain run out. Oh. Desirability for a piece of stock that we're going to steam. Got it. And also on this side, we can see more clearly where the sapwood is. The heartwood of the tree is the static section of the tree. The sapwood is what's actually adding the growth. Yeah. And so the heartwood is older, it's consolidated in oak, white oak like this, the kinds of acids uh, and chemicals called extractives that actually give oak its durability, they're to be found in the heartwood. In the sapwood, mm, not so much. Yeah. And so these are going to be more prone to rot. A piece of wood that we suspect might rot prematurely, why, we why, don't really want it in the boat. Why do it? Yeah. Sourcing the materials is more challenging than it used to be. You know, woods are getting scarcer, and so you have to think about that. Where do you live? What are the locally available woods, and if, if you can't get it locally, where are you going to get it from, and are you going to have it shipped, and it's, you know, it starts to get to be a, a pricey process. Building wooden boats is expensive and time consuming. Ready? Ready? So kids, if you're watching at home too, <coughs>
the extractives uh, are also incredibly irritating to the human body. So the more durable a wood species, the more irritating it's going to be to your lungs and your respiratory tract. And so always, always, always wear a dust mask. Uh-oh. Wood is a very satisfying material to work with. It's a really great experience. And the camaraderie is just, it's just a great time. You can do this. You absolutely can. But start with a simpler boat. You know, a stitch and glue boat comes together quite quickly. But you still learn a lot, and you still got a lot of finish work to do on it to make it yours and to make it lo lovely. And then you can move your way up. This one is a much, much more traditional style of wooden boat building with steam bent frames and planking, cast lead keel. So it's a much more elaborate boat, but it's gorgeous. I got the wood boat bug, and I think once you get that, it's sort of, you're stuck with it. A virus that won't go away. But I always thought this is like one of the most valuable things I can do with my time. And I'm trying to pass some boat building skills on to whoever's interested. Um, it's just fun. It's an enormous amount of fun and hopefully when we're done We'll have a boat that has quite a bit of value that we can then auction off or raffle or just sell uh, and, the, and all the proceeds will go to the Los Angeles Maritime Institute It's an amazing thing to think I'm fairly comfortable, but it's not enough You know, there's a way to be of service and I need to find that a way that suits my talents my interests That's the beautiful thing about Lamy. I had not intended on filming this series. My work at Lamy was supposed to be an escape from the grind of filmmaking, a way to get out from in front of the invasive glow of the computer screen and do something less stressful. I wanted to work with my hands, to be part of something meaningful. But there are times we're asked to give back, to trade something for the knowledge we're given and the friendships we forge. A former pastor had given us the materials to make this boat, Greg, Greg and Duncan were giving of their time and their skills. And me? Well, I had to make new plans for my time at Lammy. Plans that now include sharing these stories with you.